This is Curative Design, and I'm Ruin Matthews. In episode one of this three-part series, we learned of the Hungarian obstetrician Ignaz Semmelweis and his quest to uncover why young women in his hospital were dying shortly after childbirth. We had just arrived at the realization that he and his team of diligent medical students, in their zeal to uncover the cause of the deaths, were in fact part of the problem. And this is where our story continues. Samuel Weiss closely examined his team's regimented schedule. More often than not, after conducting autopsies of recently deceased patients in the mornings, he and his students would then round on the young mothers who were in labor afterwards. He surmised, and this was his breakthrough, that something was being transmitted from the bodies of the dead mothers to the ones of the living mothers. And it was his very own team that had the highest mortality, possibly through the diligence of the students in Samuel Weiss himself. They quite literally had blood on their hands. Can you imagine how profoundly upsetting this realization could have been to him? Undaunted, he set about to test his hypothesis. He tried a number of interventions, the principal one being the decision to institute a policy of cleanliness and hand washing after each autopsy and prior to delivering babies. In fact, he developed a calcium hypochlorite solution that acted as a disinfectant and insisted that all his students dip their hands into it prior to tending to their patients. More importantly, he tracked the results of his various interventions, and the results were astounding. A 90% reduction in death in the patients of the first clinic. Month after month, as the hand washing became instituted throughout the clinic, the results persisted. His students were exultant with the findings. They wrote to colleagues and editors of prestigious medical journals of their observations. Samuel Weiss himself set about trying to explain to a skeptical medical establishment the beautiful simplicity of his work, and yet was met with disdain and disbelief. In a time where the prevailing notions of disease had largely to do with the imbalance of four main humors flowing throughout the body, coupled with the presence of external miasms from the environment, people were not quite ready to believe in the existence of infectious particles that could be transmitted from one individual to another. Much has been written by how deeply this rejection affected him and actually went on to haunt him both personally and professionally. Tragically, it would cost him both his prestigious teaching post in Vienna, his marriage, and ultimately his sanity. At the relatively young age of 47, he was involuntarily institutionalized in a mental health asylum and, perhaps in an ironic term, died of an infected wound. The reason I love this story as much as I do is that I can appropriate it for a number of different teaching purposes. If I'm discussing innovation, I can focus on the series of firsts, namely the first quality improvement study, the first plan, do, check, act cycle, an early framework for germ theory followed by the first intervention in antiseptic technique, namely the calcium hypochlorite hand washing solution. Admittedly, while he wasn't the first person to suggest the concept of transmissibility from cadaver to patient, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Alexander Gordon had similar insights. He was the first to have engineered an intervention. If I'm discussing public health, I can focus on the mortality data from the two separate clinics coupled by the time and motion data to help elucidate this infectious particles theory and intervention. This would also include the discipline to study his interventions to see if mortality improved. This was seven years prior to Jon Snow, who many consider the father of modern public health with his work tracking cases of cholera in London. Or let's just say I'm hoping to talk about change management. I simply use Semmelweis's story and compare it to the work of a contemporary of his, a Scottish surgeon by the name of Joseph Lister, who astoundingly was practicing around the same time. Lister was similarly perturbed by the high rates of mortality associated with his craft of surgery and sought to do something about it. Indeed, it is fair to say that his work was heavily influenced by the discovery of a paper by a certain Hungarian obstetrician from seven years prior named Ignaz Semmelweis. The difference between the two was that while Semmelweis often took an aggressive and at times antagonistic tone to those who weren't ready to accept his findings, Lister was considered a master of marketing. He was known for his humble self-effacement, humor, and magnanimous nature. I suspect that this, coupled by Louis Pasteur's simultaneous discovery surrounding germ theory was what drove humanity towards the tipping point of practicing asepsis via hand washing and drastically reducing the mortality associated with surgery. I also use it as a caution
cautionary tale on the importance of being nice. There is ample evidence to suggest that Lister's gentler approach was a key part in forwarding his views. So regardless of how technically brilliant you are, if you're a jerk, your influence will be limited. But there's a much more profound lesson here, and it's perhaps the most important part of this story. In fact, I thought I would dedicate an entire episode just for this revelation. Tune into the final episode of The Tale of Ignaz Semmelweis for the concept that I think we can all learn from and implement into daily patient care. This is Curative Design, and I'm Erin Matthews.